Um, I want to thank our sponsors for our Naturalist Journey series this season. Thanks to Hunger Mountain Co-op, thanks to Union Mutual, to Washington Electric Co-op, to Onion River Outdoors, and to the Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix for making all of this possible this season. Uh, this presentation or this, this uh, conversation here, as well as all the other presentations that we do, this is the 27th year, I think, of Naturalist Journey's um, presentations with North Branch. So i um, glad that you could all be here with us virtually. Um, so tonight we're talking about uh, Racing the Clock, which is a uh, fabulous new book that is really um, at the intersection of running, of aging, of life, of natural history, of a lot of different things. And it's a really great read. I'm, I'm going to put a link in the chat in a little bit um, for a link to where you can pick that up at Bear Pond Books if you live in Montpelier. Um, but do, do check it out if you haven't already. And uh, I want to introduce a couple of folks. So, um, so first I'll introduce uh, Baron. So um, I know Baron means no introduction since you probably read all about him. If you haven't read all of his books, um, go to the store and get them all. Um, <laughs> Baron's a prolific author, New York Times bestseller, writing about topics really ranging from natural history to running to uh, memoirs about his family uh, and, and kind of the journey of his family to wind up in the United States. Um, just, I, I grew up personally um, reading Barron's books and, and, uh, and I can thank Barron for my, uh, my path in natural history and ecology as a field. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here um, tonight speaking with you about this, this book, Racing the Clock. Um, and I'm also joined by uh, Jason Mazarowski who is a friend of the Nature Center, uh, wears a bunch of different hats, but is a friend of the Nature Center. Um, folks may know Jason as uh, an instructor of our online winter ecology class um, and a Vermont resident, a field naturalist, alumni. Uh, he's teaching a native pollinators course for us through our Biodiversity University series uh, this summer. Uh, so check that out. Um, but Jason's also a uh, ultra marathon runner himself and is, uh, is featured a couple of times in the book, Racing the Clock. So I thought it'd be fun to, uh, to bring Jason into this uh, so we can have kind of a, a, a three-way conversation here about running, about natural history, all of that. So Jason, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Like you have been inspired by Berend and kind of set me on my naturalist runner path. So it's great to join. Um, so for tonight, we thought we'd just kind of have a casual conversation about the book. And I have a whole bunch of questions that, that came up for me as I was reading the book, um, Jason as well. And we'll just kind of see where things go. As folks have questions themselves, feel free to put them into the Q&A and I'll try to moderate those as we go. So um, as I, I was really curious, Baron. So, so Baron, you happen to be on the other side of Montpelier for me right now. Um, uh, usually you're up at, up in your place in, in Weld, Maine, and uh, and we're just like 24 hours ago, and it got me thinking that uh, you held no, still hold the record for longest distance run in 24 hours in the over 40 age group. Is that right in the masters category? I have no idea what records I hold. <laughs> There's too many of them. That's why. Uh, well, you you set the record at one point for yeah. longest distance run in 24 hours. It was yeah. just a hair under 157 miles. Yeah. And uh, and I just looked up the distance between Montpelier and Weld, Maine, and it is, believe it or not, a hair under 157 miles. <laughs> and, and I know that you were there 24 hours ago. So my first and most important question is, did you run to Montpelier or drive yesterday? Uh, well, I drove, I drove, I drive these days. Yeah. Uh, well, once is enough. Once is enough. Yeah. So you um, you ran. Uh, so when you say once is enough, but you also have so many. I'm just trying to keep track of the different running records that you've held and hold over the years um, in the same race. Well, in, in, the, in the span of just a couple of years, you set the records for um, for various records in the 100K, 100 miles, 50 miles, 50K, 12 hours, 24 hours. Um, all of this, and and you've just recently finished a couple of races as well. You had a, a race in in October. Yes. Yeah, in Chicago on the Lake Shore, uh, <clears throat> I had run it there forty years earlier, so I thought I'd try it again. And uh, 
I ran it, uh, I ran half the distance instead of 100K, I ran 50K and I ran it in, in half the, twice uh, the time. But, but I still finished first in my age group down to 60 actually. <laughs> oh, wow, that's, yeah, excellent. What was your time? I don't remember. Huh. Um, and how many other folks were in that, uh, were, were competing in that? Uh, again, I, I don't know the numbers, you know, I, I run it and, and that's it, you know, I'm, I'm done with it. So mm -hmm. I, 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 there, there weren't, I mean, there were a few hundred, but I don't know how many. Yeah. So in your, in racing the clock, you know, you, you kind of make a, a big deal about the, your kind of last 50 K race that you're going to run. Um, but I guess yeah. you decided to keep running 50 Ks, uh, in that case. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the reason for, uh, pro making the book proposal. I was going to really train for a year and, uh, and see if I could set a record, uh, at age 80, uh, because I wanted to do it on the same track on the, uh, Lake Shore of Chicago, where I'd run my best race ever. Uh, and that would be then exactly uh, 40 years later. I thought it was almost like another lifetime. I thought when I ran it first and set the record, I was 41. And so at 80, I thought, you know, that would be a, a great opportunity. And I didn't want to pass that up just for the comparison. And then, of course, the COVID came up and uh, the uh, they canceled all the races. So, but I'd already agreed to write that book. So I had to uh, switch uh, 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 topics and basically write about, you know, what came up, what I could come up with, with, with respect to aging, because that was the whole point of doing that to see, you know, what I could do basically another 40 years later after I had done it at 40, which I thought then was way too old to try for a record. So, so I, I, I ended up doing it anyways a year later mm -hmm. after the book came out. So you're a lot of, you know, this, the, the book is really interesting to read for me, you know, having run, so you also wrote um, Why We Run back in 2002. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Um, that book and and these books are are quite a bit different from one another. I was wondering if you could kind of explain kind of the difference between these two and and your your kind of rationale for writing another book about about yeah. running and taking it in a yeah. different direction. Yeah. Well, uh, the first one I had actually thought about it uh, before I ran the hundred k in Chicago. Uh, and uh, you know, kind of to motivate me to make it really worthwhile to, to have something to uh, to aim for. I was interested in in exercise as such, since I had uh, worked on that as a biologist since forever uh, with insects, and got interested in it in other animals, and so I got interested in it in us humans. And since I had been <clears throat> Uh, a runner since I was a kid. Uh, and then there was a long stretch where I didn't run. And then uh, I, uh, uh, I, I was suddenly running again and, and, and started improving. And um, I mean, I can tell the story uh, w why I entered it. It's kind of a long story, uh, but, uh, but it was kind of a, the idea was at the time it was going to be my only ultra marathon. I, I expected it be the only one, but I got, you know, after that, other races came up and says, well, you know, I can, I can run that time, so I should run it. If I don't, I'll regret it later. But it, it related, <clears throat> the first book related to, uh, to that first, uh, uh, to that first uh, uh, setting that record, which was, uh, which was a big deal for me. And, and the motivation was to run it, was to have really something to write about. One, uh, one thing that you, that you wrote in 
and why we run that I that I remember and has stuck with me since is is uh well a couple of things you had you you were experimenting with different uh foods and drinks to prepare yourself and see how your body reacted yeah. um yeah and trying all sorts of various things including beer at one point uh as your your running yeah. fuel which I think you decided didn't work out so well <clears throat> what did well, you end up uh what do you end yeah. up using for that for for long distance running for your intakes well i <clears throat> on that race i i drank just plain cranberry juice, ocean spray cranberry juice. Because uh, when I was training, <clears throat> uh, I wasn't actually taking it on the run that much, but I would, I would take it after I finished and it always tasted so good. And I said, well, you know, I wish I could have had that while I was running. And I, I actually in, in the training wasn't using it. I was just drinking afterwards and boy, that tasted good. Uh, and so I knew, you know, the body was tolerating it. And, but, you know, <clears throat> but, you know, as, as you, I don't know if I mentioned it, but uh, that backfired on me later on uh, when I, I went for another ultra race, I wanted to do, I think a 24 hour and had to drop out after, I think it was 31 miles. Uh, and when I had been drinking cranberry juice, and it turned out it was uh, uh, it was it 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 didn't have corn syrup in it. The first one had corn syrup in it, and I didn't know it, but that was sugar. That was a fuel. But this one, and I didn't read the label, and, and it had aspartame, some sweetener in it, and I totally conked out at 31 miles. I was done, you know. So wow. that was an experiment, you know. I wouldn't have done it probably. Uh, consciously but here it happened so 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 i was you know learning all, all the way along which was always interesting it was also part of the part of the thing i was always interested you know what uh, <clears throat> uh what how where endurance came from you know i know with my bees they would i know exactly how, how how long they would fly it was exactly how much honey they had on board <laughs> so uh, i felt that was fuel was very important and are you using were you still on cranberry juice last year for the uh for your last 50k uh no i didn't i i gradually switched and uh, i just took you know whatever they had on board there uh, i uh I, I, I decided it really didn't make that much difference. So I've been using all kinds of whatever, whatever kind of tasted good I would take and, and, and I didn't see much difference. So I, I took what they had to offer. Um, so one other question about that, and then I wanna pull in Jason too, cause I'm curious about your take on this as well. So another thing that, that really stuck with me from why we run that you can mention again in, uh, in Racing the Clock was, Kind of another part of your experimentation and how we end up um, as these this endurance species. You decided to not stretch as a as as your protocol, be, figuring that uh, stretching would the the elasticity uh, created by stretching would mean that you'd have to essentially do more effort over the span of an entire race. I'm just wondering if if that uh, you know if you stretch before races now if, if you what you're what you do for that well <clears throat> tell you the truth i i mean i i might bend over and stretch a little bit but you know i i don't go through any stretching routine i've i've never have um i i just don't understand the rest now what i was supposed to do and so you know i don't do it i figure you know i work into it i mean maybe if i was going to do a sprint uh be different uh, but I think with the long distance run, you <clears throat> uh, go into it kind of easy anyways. So uh, I just didn't think it was necessary and, and, I, and I never did it. Um, Jason, uh, also, yeah, Jason, feel free to like jump in and ask questions as, as you have them. I don't mean to monopolize here or anything like that, but, uh, um, but yeah, I guess, you know, come, Jason, I know that you're pretty plugged into the, to the running world. I'm curious, you know, vis-a-vis -vis stretching, you know, cranberry juice versus other intakes, like what, where does, how, um, how do you react to, to this sort of 
style of running that Berend has <laughs> been writing about. Well, when Berend was doing this back in the, the 80s, they didn't have, you know, uh, books about this stuff. At least I don't think they did. Um, yeah. Like right now, they sell all these just, you know, formulated gels, things that are specifically for ultra marathon distances um, and endurance athletics. And as yeah. far as I know, they didn't have any of that back then. Um, so Baron is kind of a, a pioneer, just experimenting, you know, like you said, going out, um, seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah. And now people have been working on it for, for 40 years and have started to, to crack the code on nutrition and mm. things like that. Um, and in terms of yeah. stretching, uh, similarly, I never really felt that it started out kind of as laziness and procrastination after I was done with high school running and I wasn't forced to stretch. I stopped doing it. And then I realized I'd never really needed it. And one of my roommates was a physical therapist and used to think I was crazy for never stretching. Um, but I was training for my first ultra marathon about six years ago. And about a week before the race, I got nervous because everything I read was saying, you know, you have to stretch, you have to do X, Y, and Z. I started stretching. And uh, I remember the first day I did, and I went for a run, my calves locked up and like, uh, it was like a softball sized knot in my calves. And so I'm like, I'm not doing that ever again. <laughs> so uh, similarly, I don't, I don't stretch and never really have. Um, I might just to get the nerves out before a race, um, but nothing like a, you know, a regimen or anything like that. Um, so kind of on that, on that note, one thing I'm, I've been really curious about um, kind of on, on the flip side of this is injury and recovery. And, and just thinking about this from like a physiological standpoint. So I was actually keeping tally throughout the book of all the different ways in which you've hurt yourself over the years. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> So uh, your first year on college cross country or track or whatever it was called back then, um, you ruptured a disc in your back, like right at the get-go. Shortly thereafter, you tore a meniscus. You yeah. tore your meniscus again, right yeah. like weeks before your Chicago 100K in the 80s. Yeah. You uh, were in Tanzania when you were young and you ruined the soles of your feet and couldn't walk in them for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. You during your PhD work, you ended up with a mystery joint pain that had you on crutches. You yeah. uh, before the race that you uh, were ending the book with, you had an ankle injury while tracking deer. Uh -huh. You recently had a, a, <laughs> a motor vehicle accident prior to the 50k you just ran. So obviously, getting injured is a huge part of, and recovering from that is a huge part yeah. of, of your life. And I'm just and. And I'm wondering um, how you how you think about injury and recovery, um, how that's changed over the years, and kind of what that story means to you. Yeah. Well, the injuries seem to be getting worse all the time, but they they're not from running. Um, I don't know. I just uh, um, you know I was chopping wood and got hit by a car and uh, I, all of these things. Um, and uh, the meniscus was pushing the car, trying, you know, when I had gone skiing um, and, you know, and, and, and my, uh, my illness of some kind in LA, uh, when I was highly stressed uh, doing my PhD, I got totally stressed out. I think that had something to do with it, some immune kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, so those have been times and when, when I didn't run. So for all I know, there may have been good rest periods as far as the running is concerned. I don't know. Uh, but I make a, a larger point with respect to injury. I think, you know, running uh, hard uh, induces, you know, micro injury. And, uh, and then there has to be, well, there is a recovery. If you let it, there'll always be recovery. And I've had the worst injuries and always recovered. But running, you know, produces uh, micro injuries. And I think uh, I see it as a stimulus, perhaps, of the body 
to to uh, to uh, to do something about it, and like an alerting mechanism. Uh, that's what I think training is. But of course, no big injury like that. But but yeah, I I, I just am amazed, and it's also motivated me because every time when I got recovered, I thought, oh my God, what a relief. When you, when you have it, it feels like uh, it's the end of the world. And then you get better and it feels like you're starting anew. You, uh, got, you're really, really thankful that, that you're healthy again and can go out. And so it's a gift to, to have that. And if you don't have it, then you don't really feel the gift of, of being healthy that you can run. So yeah, uh, I uh, uh, I feel very lucky, uh, and uh, and and I think at this point I recover fairly quickly. I mean, I got hit by the car, and then had an operation on uh, had a subdural hematoma on the head, and they had to drill my skull to get the blood out. Uh, I passed out, and uh, you know, and now I feel fine. So you know, I I. I feel really thankful to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're. I'm glad you're still here too. There's um. There's a uh, a few folks in the chat here that are wondering about um, injuries, particularly around um, uh, injuries as the result of uh, aging and overuse of your knees. Say, and you write a little bit about this in in Racing the Clock um, yeah. about how your knees are fine essentially. Um, you want to speak to kind of yeah. overuse yeah. of your joints and that sort of thing? Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, the, the, all the people that I know that really have knee problems, most have the most of them are the ones that don't run. I mean, my, my sister, for example, she's never run a, a step in her life and she had knee problems since long. And, and a lot of people that, that I know uh, who, who have knee problems, they don't run. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, there's no, no reason for the body to say, okay, I got to watch out for these knees and, and, and keep them healthy. If they're not going to be used, you know, why bother to fix them kind of thing, you know? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I use them and every time I use them, uh, they, they recover because the body says, okay, I know I've seen this before. I'm going to do something. Have to be a little bit anthropomorphic to, to get that across, but it's a, it's, it's not necessarily uh, 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 a uh, a sign that you have to stop. Well, and it sounds like you're saying that you know running itself is and and hard exercise is uh, is creating micro injuries and mic and then you know yeah. a constant level of repair, and so you're yeah. essentially training your body to be able to recover quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, which yeah. prepares you for better recovery from more severe yeah. injuries. That's what I think, yeah. But, you know, I don't have any proof, uh, but, but that seems to be empirically uh, true, as far as I can tell. You have a nice uh, analogy in your book talking about uh, exercise is almost like home ownership, in that, uh, you know, if somebody's living in the house and keeping up with it every so often, the house can stand and be fine for a long time, as long as you're yeah. giving it fresh coat of paint once in a while and yeah. preparing yeah. the trim and stuff like that. But if you, uh, you know, if you go away and leave the house for a few years and you come back yeah. to it, it's going to be in shambles. And yeah. same with, with yeah, you leave it alone, do nothing with it. It just rots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was wondering a little bit about kind of the physiology behind this like repair machinery. You mentioned um, telomerase in particular as, as kind of one example of like what's actually happening when, when, you know, when this repair machinery is at work and how exercise kind of, well, you know, I guess one of the things that you, that you talk about is how um, this regular exercise is also kind of staving away uh, aging. Um, in, in many ways, yeah. and, and that there's a connection between this kind of repair machinery from recovery from exercise and just um, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. being able to prevent aging as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was yeah wondering if you could kind of talk to that machinery a little bit that's at play. Well, I mean, I, th I, I think I was thinking of it in a, in a kind of a macro way. Uh, when you look at, for example, 
uh, some animals, you amputate uh, uh, a tail from a lizard, you know, uh, it grows a new one. And that new uh, tail is like, bra is, is like just born and the old ta tail is gone. So, uh, you know, you extend that to, to, uh, to the tissues. It's the same way, you cut yourself uh, <clears throat> or you have an, uh, you remove something and, and you regrow. Uh, you know, some animals can regrow <clears throat> more parts than others. Uh, but I think uh, just about all organisms can regrow cells. Uh, they might not be able to regrow. They can't regrow a head for the most part, <laughs> but some of them can regrow a limb. Uh, they certainly can regrow tissue that has been damaged. And that's, that's brand new. It's like it was born. But, you know, so I don't know. Uh, as far as longevity is concerned, I, I uh, you know, how, how you uh, would really know, you know, if it might actually affect aging. But I know that <clears throat> uh, those uh, animals that stay juvenile the longest, you know, they live the longest. The, the quicker they grow up, the quicker they die. So reducing, uh, growth rate uh, is, is a way of extending. So for example, you know, I was thinking of myself there, you know, I was rather undeveloped in the sense that I grew very, very slowly because when I was young, I had very little to eat. So I was, uh, uh, you know, stunned it. And you look at some animals and if you, uh, you look at uh, mice, for example, if you give them all they want to eat, and stick them in a cage, uh, they will eat like crazy and they will grow up really, really quick and they'll die quick. If you keep them hungry, they're gonna take a long time to grow up and they're gonna grow older. So again, uh, it's, it's uh, a matter of, of re, you know, putting in new parts, replacing if it's damaged or building them. And if, if, if it's already there, then, uh, then it, it's going to senesce. It's like that uh, that parable of like if a ship sets sail with a cargo full of all the boards needed to replace the ship and you replace the, the, the boards in the ship one at a time uh, so that when you arrive at port, you know, you've replaced everything. Do you have this? Is it the same? Is it the same ship or not? So it's like you're yeah. essentially replacing all of the boards in your body uh, yeah. through, yeah. through yeah. You know, exercise. Yeah. Um, I have a I have a whole bunch more questions, Jason. I want to pause and see if you wanted to to chime in, um, since we have you. Yeah, I was just wondering, Baron. Uh, have you checked if this most recent race was any sort of record? Or have you, I what? If the most recent race you ran set any records? Uh, I, uh, I I haven't pers checked personally, but I presume the race director would have. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, I, I didn't think it was uh, fast enough to do that. Uh, I, I don't think I, I I don't think I set any record. I mean, you know, I, I ran that uh, after I had the accident and uh, uh, and uh, and I had the operation. Uh, you know, I had the the head operation the whole time, uh, the hematoma <laughs> in the head, and and they only fixed it afterwards. Uh, so I had basically no hope. The main thing was, uh, you know, I, I, I ran the whole thing and I didn't stop. Uh, so um, I think the race director, he, he would have told me if I had set a record. I didn't even look up the record. I didn't even want to know. I was just going to do the best I could and that's it. I don't know of many octogenarians out there uh, running 50Ks. No, so, and if they I don't are, know. I don't know if they're going as fast as you went. Yeah, well, uh, I I just didn't think uh, anybody. You know, it took me. What was I, I? I don't even remember the time. I didn't even want to know. You know, all all I want to do was finish it, and I ran the whole thing. Uh, but but maybe I should look it up. I I'm just too lazy. 
I, I figured there, now there's nothing more I can do about it. I've done it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let it go at that. I'll look it up. I think it's worth, uh, worth inquiring. <laughs> okay. I don't even know what the time is at this point. This brings up actually something I thought was really interesting about how you framed um, the book. In, in many ways, the title of the book, Racing the Clock, is great because it's as much about running as it is about just understanding, like having a relationship with time in, in general and yeah. um, and how you set goals related to like what what one's body is capable as as one gets older. Um, and uh, yeah, you just you, you spoke a lot about um, or you wrote a lot about how um, you know the importance of having you know a healthy relationship with time and, and kind of setting yeah. you know, doing saying okay I'm gonna try to do the best I can for this age bracket in terms of running and and yeah. setting other goals outside of running in, in kind of the same way. Can you just talk a little bit about just kind of your relationship with with time in general and how you how you see that? Well. Hmm. I guess, yeah, I, I don't even know what time is. I try to keep thinking about it. All I can think of is time is just the interval between events. Uh, and then we have a standard for that. We go by, by, by the rotation of the earth around the sun. That's a year and, and we go from there. Uh, so that's, that's our standard for time. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I may, maybe there are mathematical equations that tell you what time is, but uh, but you know our time. You know we, we know you know a, a lifetime. We know what the events are, and and we know that in relation to to the to to the to the sun. And uh, but we measure it against all kinds of standards, you know, uh, how fast we run. Uh, and, uh, and so it gives us a, uh, uh, something to aim for. That, that's what I see. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's, it's strictly dependent on you know, what's, what's, what's being done. If nothing is being done, there's no time at all, right? So uh, I don't know. I, I haven't been too philosophical about time, but just about the clock uh, <laughs> and and uh, and what I could do in a certain amount of time. Well, when you when you open in the first couple of chapters, you talk about when you kind of introduce the idea of time. You're writing about bees and really about how time for a lot of for a lot of um, mm -hmm. Well, for for animals yeah. um, or other organisms, time is less about you know this trajectory, this arc that you have to fit things within, and more it's almost like a tool. It's a wayfinding tool in, in nature in many ways. And you talk about how um, you know bees can find their way to nectar sources by having that internal clock that is is yeah. tuned to yeah. the sun. I thought that was just a really great um, yeah. idea. Yeah. Well, definitely. Uh... <clears throat> I was very interested in how uh, how animals do measure time, yeah, and uh, and and I think you know the situation with <clears throat> the story with bees is the most interesting of all. Is is how here uh, they because they know time, uh, they can uh, they can somehow tell time. They uh, uh, they incorporate that into the communication of where food is because they, they indicate food and the direction in relation to the angle to the sun, it is to the sun from, from the hive where they start. Uh, but they communicate that inside the hive and it's dark and you don't see the sun. So when the bee comes out, it has, it has learned the angle to go on a on a horizontal and has to convert it to a vertical uh, with respect to the angle of the sun and go that same angle. So it has to know the time in order to get where it wants to go. Uh, so in the same way, when we run, you know, we have this time by the clock uh, that, that tells us uh, 
uh, something about you know what we've done. It gives us a measure of 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 uh, um, determining uh, you know what uh, what what is the quality of it really. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned that uh, well you make the comparison between what the bees are doing inside the hive in the dark like that and kind of what we do um, in nautical travel and in sailing you know we're we're kind of yeah. doing those calculations like yeah. that and so yeah. you know with bees it's 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 evolved yeah. it's instinctual with us we're using mathematics yeah. like I'm I'm curious if you like want to just like wild speculation I'm wondering if you if you've thought about whether or not you know humans are capable of you know, being aware of our circadian clock to the extent that we can use time and sun as a wayfinding tool, you know, or if, that, if that's something that's kind of buried, buried deep within, I don't know, maybe I'm going. Well, I mean, we, 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 we have instruments for that. We, we can't do it as well as the bees probably internally uh, because uh, we just go by landmarks and we don't go very far. Uh, but if obviously sailors do, uh, this is all learned behavior and the birds can, uh, you know, they use the sun for orientation too. They can fly a straight line by keep changing the angle with respect to the sun because they keep track of time and they automatically adjust. Now, I don't think we could do that. Uh, so we need instruments to do it, uh, you know, but we don't, I think it's a really interesting problem because we don't know you know what the mechanism is they don't have a dial that they're looking at so how can they tell uh, but you know to some extent we can too but i think you know they've done experiments put people in absolute dark uh, uh light or absolute darkness in a cave or something where they have no reference uh and and we find <clears throat> that <clears throat> we humans don't have a very good we can't we don't keep track with the with the external time uh, so we get off track, huh. uh, probably because we ha have no real reason to to do to uh, to have that living in you know Aboriginal communities uh, where we just go by the roughly by the sun um, and moon uh, and uh, <clears throat> but you know of course we learn and uh, use the stars as well as the birds do too. I was thinking about uh, the you referenced the San people in in uh, Botswana and Namibia um, quite a bit, and yeah, you know, and just imagining kind of where where we where we evolved, you know, what we're evolved to do is chase a kudu across the savanna for thirteen hours, running it down, yeah. and presumably, you know, once you've once you run down the kudu, you are really far away from where you started. Um, and so there's an element of, of navigation kind of yeah. required uh, for yeah. us to be able to yeah. to be able to be endurance athletes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone has uh, has uh, you know questioned the sun people, uh, you know, the hunters, uh, how far they actually go and 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 how they find their way back. If it's a matter of familiarity, they gradually know the hills, the mountains, and use that as a reference for angles. Uh, uh, but uh, um, they would certainly be good subjects, but you know, I, I haven't studied that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to check a couple of the questions in the chat here. And while I do, Jason, if you have any, any questions you want to jump in with, please do. Yeah, you read about this quite a bit towards the end of the book, but um, for those who are joining who might not have read it, uh, I'm curious on your take about how the, the sport has evolved and changed over 40 years. Because as an ultra runner who didn't really start running ultras until you know the 2000s, um, yes. the thought of running on like a track or a road seems crazy to me. Um, yeah. And I'm sure the opposite, yeah. the thought of running on trails yeah. and mountains yeah. seems crazy to you. Um, yeah, where it really has evolved. So I'm I'm interested to get your take on that. Yeah, it really has changed an awful lot. I mean, <clears throat> you know, initially I thought you know only in terms of the mile. I mean, here is something you can measure, um, and uh, uh, 
and that was the standard, but then, you know, then it was cross country. Uh, and then at least there was a course, uh, but that only, so if you were a really great runner, you had that course. So in other words, you, you were only part of that family there. You couldn't compare it with anything else. So uh, in order to, you know, make comparisons, you have to have a standard distance. And I think, you know, it was the distance bec became longer and longer, like might be a mile and then it was 10 miles. And then somebody came in the crazy idea of racing for 10 miles. And really crazy was, was, was more international than what was 100K. So I felt, you know, if you really wanted to run distance and see, you know, what you could do, the 100K would be the, the race to do it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now though, um, you know, I was noticing <clears throat> you were the one that uh, uh, led me to the Vermont uh, 50 uh, and here was my first trail race. Uh, you know, I, I, I would like uh, running trails uh, and running in the woods, but I never thought of it as a competition. This was, you know, recreation to being out in the woods uh, on, on the trail. But you know this in, in the uh, context of a, of a race, uh, what is something you know that that started later, uh, except you know there were these races like the one in California, the Death Valley race. You know how you could survive at at uh, at the really high temperatures and something like that. So uh, the races have gotten ever more uh, crazier to make it. So more and more obstacles. So it's it's just in, uh, the more obstacles it has, uh, the better, uh, the more it tests uh, everything. Uh, you know, not just the endurance, but uh, you know now now it's it's almost death-defying if you do it up you know up in the mountains. So it becomes a heroic thing in what you can survive. Uh, but then it was just a matter if you could survive running the distance. But then it became more and more, it was okay to walk. You know, I would never consider, if I had stopped to walk, I would have dropped out. I just, there's no thing, there's no way you're gonna walk. That, that's quitting. That's what was called quitting. Uh, and, uh, but now, you know, people regularly, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. You, you just, uh, uh, the race is such that it's a matter of obstacles rather than just speed. So that has been a big change. And I think that's interesting. Uh, and, and I think it's good because, you know, after a while, you know, uh, when there are no more, uh, uh, you know, running, uh, running uh, on, on a quarter mile track uh, for 24 hours gets to be very boring. Uh, and uh, 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 in order to have that specific time, and you know, after a while, uh, you know, if if somebody uh, has has done it in 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 a in a really fast time, and you know, there's no way you can ever catch up with that. You're not going to be spending you know a year training to try to beat that record when you know you can't, or you no, know, chances are very high that you can't. So you know, there's a different venue. You know. It, it changes from one to another, and so I ran this uh, uh, this uh, trail race, and you know I really enjoyed it. Uh, but it was definitely something very different, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, it it was more a celebration, I would say. You know, people had a lot of fun. There was like a big party, uh, so it was a very different thing. Uh, rather than you know head-to-head -head competition and 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 I like that. There's a great question I'd like to read from Dudley here. Um, so, uh, Dudley says, "I loved your descriptions of being a child in the woods, learning and exploring during the war period. Today's children, growing up much less in the outdoors and more in front of screens, will see the world differently. How do you think that will affect their views and how can we most effectively interest them in the details of the natural world that you described so well? And do running or other sports offer any doorway into that world? Well, I think, I think they do. I mean, um, but actually <clears throat> just being out there, uh, 
you know, I I was still into that a little bit. I remember running the Lake Marowag uh, 100K and it goes through uh, uh, rural areas. <clears throat> and uh, I remember looking for caterpillars as I was running along because I was going by the bushes, something to look for. Uh, but you have to, you know, start that early. Uh, and, and I think that would have to start in its, on its own, uh, uh, just encouraging kids to just look at nature. And then, then that might lead to wanting to be out there and, and, and moving around uh, to find. Uh, you know, I started out uh, collecting beetles and, you know, I, I never gave running a thought. It was just come natural if I wanted to get there or if I had to chase that flying beetle or wasp or whatever. Uh, but, but, you know, having the goal to chase was first. The same as, you know, when I go hunting, I get deer hunting. I, I, I spend all day out in the woods, uh, uh, but it's not for exercise. It's, it's to have the nature contact. Uh, and, and that uh, it definitely was is good exercise, uh, lots of physical activity. <clears throat> and I think that's what we got to uh, 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 promote uh, reasons for being out there because no kid is going to be out in the woods unless they're going to get something out of it. And uh, uh, as long as they get uh, uh, one thing out of it, eventually they'll put 10 things into it. So. Uh, it, it's not free, but uh, you know they have to get something out of it. I mean, my son, he was on a uh, um, Audubon kind of thing, and 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 the instructor, uh, he he found this beautiful beetle and he wanted it, and the instructor said to put it down, don't touch nature. And that was the end of it for him, and I don't blame him. I mean, picking up a beetle is not going to do anything to the ecology. It knows it's somebody who says that knows nothing about ecology, <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, you know they they have to have a reason and they can't be guilty about it. You know, touching nature, they don't touch that flower. You know, geez, you know, no, you got to have contact, and that's what I would recommend. One of the things I appreciated so much about being a winter ecology student of yours, and maybe Jason can echo this, is is being able to you know, play in the woods like a child um, in many ways. And I believe you said, you know, when introducing us to the land, you said, if you want to see something that's at the tip top of the tree, either climb up to the top or cut it down. And, uh, and I just love that, that approach that, you know, and, you know, we walked away from, from that week having our eyes opened, um, you know, with so much curiosity and having explored so much in a way that many of us didn't really Feel we had the permission to since we were we were little kids and so i think that's so important yeah. whether you're yeah. whether you're young or whether you're you know yeah. whatever age you are yeah. to be to be you know hands-on respectfully yeah. um yeah sure. yeah i i uh you know I, I i could see you you guys getting really interested by by being able to touch it and and study it and take it home and uh uh and um, get get intimate with it and get to learn it and and that is what that's what took all of us out into the woods we'd be out in the woods all day because there were more and more things that we could find and see um and i agree with sean especially as a grad student and like you're you know halfway through our master's degree and you're so used to everyone telling you it's experimental design this and that yeah. and like everything's so rigid yeah. but then just going out there for winter ecology for a week yeah. it's and just getting to play like yeah. you're a kid again and explore yeah. and follow wherever yeah. your curiosity takes you yeah. um it's something that we don't get enough of even as graduate yeah. students yeah um, i always thought yeah. it was really refreshing coming back uh, um, and sort of seeing you know, science and nature in a, a different light than we're not used to anymore. Yeah. That reminds me um, of, a, of a question or just a comment and, and something I was hoping you could talk about a little bit um, in terms of your style as a, as a biologist or a, a physiologist and how you, how you have throughout your career, 
you know, a lot of your, the things that you've been most interested in came, uh, the discovery came from very simple experiments that you set up. It wasn't about some fancy new technology or big machine or, or you know, statistical models. It's, it's you know, in, in so many cases, it was a really elegant, very simple experiment that you had to test a question that you had. And I just wanted to kind of flag that as something that's so, um, that I think resonates so well to those who are getting interested in science and who are daunted by uh, what science might look like today. And just wanted to ask you to, to talk about, you know, your, your experimental design and, and your, your, um, how you're a fan of, of simple experiments. Yeah. Well, the thing is, once you see the thing and, and uh, if you have a question, uh, you don't necessarily have to answer it all at once, but you can just with curiosity say, you know, what will happen if this, if you change this in the environment, you see what they're doing and you see what they're interested in, see what their habits are and then <clears throat> vary something uh, one way or the other. Uh, and just any variable and uh, uh, the one that seems reasonable, most of them may not, affected at all. But after a while, you it's a matter of observations. I mean, like, uh, you know, I was so surprised that I made discoveries of things that I thought everyone, uh, well, that, that I didn't have the answer to, but nobody else did either because they didn't look. I mean, you know, like, like grouse who, uh, who dive into the snow, uh, you know, the, the dogma is they do it, you know, to keep warm on, uh, on cold nights. Well, uh, that's a good hypothesis and they probably do. Uh, but, you know, but then I chased one up in the middle of the day on a sunny day. So that didn't hold, it was warm and didn't have to be down there. Well, you know, so then I started taking loops uh, and it's actually almost like a running loop every day running this, uh, uh, snowshoeing this this loop of about a mile, and I would look for where the grouse had uh, had had sat in the snow, and pretty soon I found some uh, some of the dens were had a few uh, uh, droppings, uh, half a dozen. Some would have fifty. Some would have five, and I could tell after a while, you know, how long, uh, uh, you know, like four poops meant an hour. So I could, I had a poop clock and I could say, you know, how long they'd been there. And then I knew when they went in and when they came out. Uh, and so pretty soon I could tell, you know, when they were and under what conditions and why. And part of it was, uh, was predator avoidance. Uh, they were hidden under the snow and there were goshawks out there and great horned owls that would catch them uh, if, if they were exposed. Uh, and so they only fed at a very certain time. It, at dusk and it quickly went down under the snow uh, uh, when the great horned owls would have otherwise been catching them. So it's a matter of having an interest in the animal or, or the plant uh, and, and seeing experiments and, and seeing what happens. I mean, uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, it's fun to, to see that you make an assumption and you find out that, yeah, it's correct. And sometimes it's not, you never know. One of the ones, the experiments you talk about in Racing the Clock was trying to figure out how moths thermoregulate. And we were, I believe, trying to figure out whether or not they use their abdomen to kind of shed heat. And uh -huh. so you used a human hair and tied a little knot around their abdomen to prevent, um, prevent blood flow and then took the temperature of and then just saw what happened. So like, I mean, yeah. not really great for the moth, but a really simple experiment to, yeah. to learn how, how they work. Well, it wasn't quite that crude. I didn't tie off the whole abdomen. I actually tied off near the dorsal vessel that is close to the top of the abdomen. Uh, so there's just a, a, a vessel uh, <clears throat> uh, that connects and I could tie that off just with a surgical needle. Uh, but you know that was one of the experiments, and and that was actually the best one. 
you know, I, I had other data that showed the same thing that they were using the abdomen to get rid of excess heat because they were exercising so intensely beating their wings 60 times per second. So that's a lot of muscle product, muscle uh, contraction and heat production uh, that they were using the abdomen as a heat radiator. Uh, uh, and, and then, you know, my professor said, no, I don't believe it. He says, you know, you've got to, to test it, you've got to eliminate the, the circulatory system, big chance, right. Well, I just happened to have a needle handy and I did it. And there it was. Uh, and, and the moth had no problem taking off. And then within a minute was overheated and boom, it had like, uh, uh, you know, over 110 degrees Fahrenheit and, and cooked. So, uh, so yeah, it's not always that easy, but, uh, uh, but, but there's only one way to, to find out is to, to fiddle with it. And, and starting the by starting with just observations of, of their behavior and asking questions, then, like you said, modifying one variable yeah. with a simple design and seeing yeah. what happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, couple questions I want to ask from the from the audience, and, and then I want to give Jason a, a moment to ask a couple of questions too. Um, Ben's asking, uh, how did you get started in communicating science? Many scientists struggle to communicate their work, and yet you've excelled at this for so long. Uh, how did I do it? Oh yeah, how did you get started in communicating science? And then also, I would say you know you've you know you're a you're a biologist, you're an ecologist, and you have yeah. a lot of books. And I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, why why yeah. have you yeah. you know why books as to your form of communication? Yeah. And... Okay. Well, uh, it isn't any science really unless it is communicated first of all. So it's got to be uh, <clears throat> written up. Uh, in, in a way uh, that, uh, that that other colleagues who are, are knowledgeable in that area can critique. So it has to be written up. If it's not written up, as far as science is concerned, it, it has to be published. If it's not published, it's, it doesn't exist. So others can review it. So, but the thing was, uh, you know, I was working with the with the moths and then with the bumblebees. <clears throat> uh, one thing led to another. Uh, and uh, uh, once you start watching the animal, it, uh, you wonder what another one does that's a little bit different, has a different habits, or you do the same one in a different situation. Uh, and pretty soon, you know, I was, I was uh, uh, first doing that with the moths and then finding that the that the bumblebees did the same thing instead of they were using the abdomen not only to get rid of excess heat from the thorax when they're flying, but uh, they were using the abdomen as, as, uh, as a heater of the babies, of the eggs and the larvae in the nest. So uh, a bee with, or the queen starting a colony would sit on the brood clump, the pollen with the eggs and larvae in it, and put the abdomen on it, <clears throat> shiver with its flight muscles, and shunt the heat onto to heat the brood. So it was using the same mechanism for a different purpose. So it wasn't just waste that heat, it was actually being used. Uh, and then, you know, there had to be honey coming in. So, so where did the honey come from? And uh, then you watch the foraging, what flowers are they using? Why this one and not that one? So, you know, one thing leads to another and keeps going and going and going. Uh, and pretty soon it's, it's in flower evolution. Why is that flower blue and that one red and that one white? Uh, and because it's specializing now. Uh, and so it's for reproduction uh, so that the flowers are different so that they get uh, pollinated by the same, uh, by the, from one flower to the other, not from a rose to a, a goldenrod or whatever. Uh, so they have, so they specialize by being different, etc. So one leads to another. So I was doing, so with the bumblebees, for example, it went in so many directions all at once. So I said, well, I have to put it together to make a story out of it. So that's when I wrote Bumblebee Economics and, uh, and, and that started. Uh, 
almost with every project, it went like that. So you end up with a book because you have so many, so many different threads that you're running with that that yeah, it, right. it's hard to contain it in the format of peer-reviewed papers and and yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and and also you want to share it so other people can see it too who are not really experts in the topic, uh, because it's interesting. Yeah, if we know more about what's out there and why. Um, I want to ask one more question from uh, from our chat here, and then I want to uh, let uh, Jason ask a, a last question or two. I know that we're we're at our time limit, and I feel like I could ask questions for the next four hours, but I want to be respectful of your of your evening here. Um, but a good question that several folks are asking is, um, what do you suggest for people who want to start running and particularly start running long distances? Um, uh, what's your yeah? What's your advice for for those of us? Uh Tomorrow morning, go out for a half mile run and, and see how it feels and, you know, and keep doing it. And, and what you'll do after a while, you'll do a mile and, and, and after a while, you'll do two miles, et cetera. And, or you, you know, write down what you do every day, keep a record of it. Uh, so you see what you've been doing um, and take notes on, you know, uh, how you feel and, and maybe what you eat or what you drink or, or uh, anything about it so that you're thinking about it and, and start small and, 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 and don't stress yourself. Uh, and, and, you know, after a while, uh, uh, you'll find you'll be going further and further. Uh, but you know, there's no rush to it. Uh, just think in the long term and, and, and keep, it, uh, <clears throat> keep it enjoyable. Uh, and, uh, and the only way to keep it enjoyable is to, uh, um, is to start out easy. And eventually you probably have, have some, some goals. You have some idea what you're doing and then you see some kind of a goal. Okay, I'm going to do it uh, down to that corner or, or that mile post and, and come back. And then you get back and you have sense of achievement. Before that, it was, seemed impossible, but now you did it. Uh, so you, you have positive feedback from, from your results. Well, uh, I ran 5K today and I was very happy about that. Um, so I have a long way to go until I get to 50K, but, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe one day at the end of the year, we yeah. can go running together and that'll be my goal to, <laughs> to work towards. Okay, um, well, I'll be around, so we'll do it. Jason, um, I'd love to give you last last shot for a couple of questions here, if you'd like. Yeah, I'd like to uh, feed off of the last question and then ask one, one final one. Um, so yeah, for, for me, I've always found that running has made me a better naturalist and being a naturalist has made me a better runner and they just kind of feed off of each other. Um, Cause for me, like at least in grad school, when I'd go out for a run, I'd run up a hill and the entire way up, I'd be saying the common names of the plants and the whole way down, I'd be saying the scientific names of the plants, just every yeah. plant I'd see. And that's just uh, how I studied botany. Uh, uh -huh. um, and I found that if I find something uh -huh. out there that I'm really interested in, like a nest, yeah. like there was a raven nest in Burlington that I, yeah. I always wanted to go visit. I never had to think twice about running. Like I yeah. couldn't wait to get out the door and go check on that nest. And running was just the, the mode yeah. Yeah. by which I would get there. And then, yeah, um, yeah. yeah similarly, you yeah. know, running, running is a way to, to get out and discover these things. So yeah. I guess my question to, to Berend is, uh, can you recall any like incredible finds or like discoveries you've made while you've been out running that led to something bigger, like a bigger question that you pursued as a naturalist? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up because it's, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, for me, I don't know <clears throat> if uh, I made any great discovery while I'm running, but I do uh, um, get a uh, sense of, of, of the overview. I see, you know, what birds are out, uh, what the habitat is like, you know, what plants are blooming, like you say. And uh, so you get an overview, but uh, 
that allows you to, to focus down. You know, I, I wasn't so much interested in, in, in the Latin names of the different plants because I was interested in the animals, but I can see, for example, okay, now at this time of year, the, the swallowtail butterflies are out and, and they're all gathering at this one spot. You might see that, or here's a flock of blue jays flying by. What are they doing here? Or oh, there's a raven nest. Uh, so they're always, uh, you know, it's a way of just contacting nature and getting familiar with it so that you can see, even if it's not right there, you might actually see something uh, someplace else. Uh, but you have, you have the overview, you have to have an overview in order to see what sticks up. Um, well, Baron, thank you so much for giving us uh, an hour of your evening here. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. I hope we get yeah. to continue this conversation in the future. Uh, yeah. A couple of folks are wondering um, how to get in touch. Um, so there's a couple of quick things. Um, I put I just put a link in the chat for those of you that are interested to um, to the book Racing the Clock uh, over at Bear Pond Books. You can pick it up if you live in Montpelier. Um, and I also put a, uh, my email address, Sean, S-E-A-N, at northbranchnaturecenter.org. So if you have any questions that we didn't get to today that you really want to know more about or any follow-up or anything like that, um, just send me an email and, and we can go from there. Um, this, uh, we'll, this, we'll have this recording of our conversation up on our website, northbranchnaturecenter.org slash presentations um, in the next couple of days. So if you missed anything, you can go check it out there. Um, but yeah, again, thank you very much, Baron, and we really appreciate your time. And thank you, Jason, also for, for hanging out with us uh, for this evening as well. And I look forward to seeing both of you again soon. Okay, well, thank you, Sean. Yep. Jason. Good night. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Good night. Good night.